my name is David Connolly and in this video I'm going to present the key outputs from the Smart Energy Europe project. And just to start by letting you know that this pro project is already complete and the report is available online uh, in both a report format and also published as a peer-reviewed journal article. So please visit the website if you'd like to download the report and learn a bit more about it. The other thing I should say is that it's also a spin-out project from the Heat Roadmap Europe series, which is a project that primarily focuses on the heating and cooling sector in Europe. However, Smart Energy Europe builds on this work by not just looking at how the heating and cooling sector can become renewable, but looking at the whole energy system transforming to renewable energy in the future. So to begin, I suppose, I, as you can guess by the title, that the Smart Energy Europe project is based on the smart energy system concept. And that's something you can find out a lot more about by going to the website smartenergysystem.eu. And that's a concept that we have developed at Aalborg University for many years now, looking at how can energy systems transition from fossil fuels to 100% renewable energy. There's a lot of information on the website, but very briefly, I'm going to explain the key principles behind the smart energy system concept. To do that, I'm going to start by looking at today's energy system. So if we look at today's energy system, you can see it's made up of a few different demands, mostly mobility, electricity, and heating and cooling. And each, each of these demands is very much connected back to fossil fuels. We have mobility linked to oil, primarily through combustion engines. Electricity production is very much supplied by power stations using primarily oil and, and coal, or sorry, coal and gas. And then we have heating primarily supplied by boilers via oil and natural gas. So therefore, all sectors are very connected to fossil fuels and all sectors are very isolated from one another. And this is all about to change dramatically because these fossil fuels are going to be replaced by renewable energy. And that means that we can no longer rely on having large amounts of stored energy in our fuel supply. In other words, in today's energy system, all of the energy storage and flexibility that we need is contained here in the stored energy of fossil fuels. But as we replace these fossil fuels, we can no longer rely on that stored energy because we're going to use a lot of wind and solar power. And one of the main reasons we need so much wind and solar power is that we simply don't have enough bioenergy to replace all of these fossil fuels. In the Smart Energy Europe project, we looked at how much bioenergy is sustainably available in Europe today. And these columns here represent the amount of bioenergy that we have in Europe based on a lot of different reviews. And as you can see from the average um, amount that's displayed here by the bar, it's much less than the amount of fossil fuels that we need in Europe today. The, the error bars here illustrate the minimum and maximum estimates from each of these studies. And as you can see, only some of the most extreme maximum estimates would actually provide enough bioenergy to replace fossil fuels, which is illustrated here by the light pink or dark pink uh, line going across the graph. So what we can conclude from this is that bioenergy can definitely help us convert to renewable energy, but it is going to be a very in-demand resource. And what we've done in Smart Energy Europe is we've taken the average amount of bioenergy available from all of these reviews and taken the minimum estimate from all of these uh, reviews as our bioenergy resource available to us. In other words, this is the amount of bioenergy that we allow our modeling to use in Smart Energy Europe, meaning that the gap between this bioenergy amount and the demands that we have must be supplied by other forms of renewable energy, which is primarily in the form of wind and solar power. And the reason that this is such a challenge is due to the intermittency of wind and solar power. The wind and solar have no storage locked up in them like fossil fuels do or like bioenergy does, which means we need to find new forms of flexibility and stored energy in our energy system. And this brings us to the smart energy system concept. The whole principle of the smart energy system concept is to find new forms of stored energy and flexibility. And that means that we can accommodate these very large amounts of wind and solar power. And we do that by connecting our wind and solar power to cheap forms of energy storage. In other words, we create new connections across the sectors, very importantly, across the sectors, across mobility, electricity, and heating and cooling, that will then connect our wind and solar power to new forms of cheap storage. So for example, by connecting the sectors to one another, so let's say by connecting the electricity sector with the heating sector, 
via these heat pumps. If the wind is blowing too much, then we can turn on the heat pumps and store the extra wind power as therm in a thermal storage tank. A thermal storage device is about 100 times cheaper than electricity storage, which means that this is a very cheap way to integrate wind power. Another option is that if there's too much wind power, we can activate an electrofuel plant and then store the wind power as a fuel storage. So in other words, when we create the fuel in the electrofuel plant using the wind power, we can then store the fuel in a fuel storage. And a fuel storage is around 100 times cheaper than a thermal storage tank. So again, we're getting very cheap forms of flexibility. And this is the whole principle behind the smart energy system concept, creating new forms of flexibility and new forms of demands so that we can integrate more wind and solar power. And I've just summarized some of the key forms of flexibility here in this highlights. Number one, we can regulate the power plants and the electricity demands in order to accommodate wind power. And that's something we already do today. But the new things are we can connect wind to thermal storage, as I pointed out. We can start connecting wind power to the batteries in our electric vehicles, and we can connect wind power to fuel storage via electrofuels. And there's a lot more information about all of these on the Smart Energy System website, but this is just to give you a flavor of what we're doing when we make this transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And by accessing these really cheap forms of energy storage, we can actually transform to very large amounts of renewable energy without increasing the costs significantly. And that's something I want to demonstrate here today in the Smart Energy Europe paper. So the two things I want to describe in more detail in the rest of the video are number one, how can the transition actually happen? So how do we go from fossil fuels over to 100% renewable energy? And secondly, what will the consequences be? How much will it cost us? How will it affect our energy consumption? How will it affect our carbon emissions? And so on. So let's start with the first one. How do we actually make this transition? And to make this understandable and pedagogical, we've broken down the transition in Smart Energy Europe into a series of steps. And these steps start with a business as usual scenario for the European Union. So step one, which is called here, is EU28, which is the 28 member states of the European Union, at least before the UK left. And it's the CPI scenario, which means current policies initiative, which means it's a business as usual. It's based on existing policies for the European 28 as far as the year 2050. So in other words, this starting point is a business as usual development before, for the European 28 European Union member states as far as the year 2050. And we start by modeling that in our software and then we compare that starting point to a series of other steps that we can carry out. So we start by modeling this system, then we model all of these different steps and we compare what the impact is when we make all of these changes. So the first change is we remove nuclear power, then we put a lot of heat savings in our buildings, so better insulation, better doors and windows, and then we convert a lot of our passenger cars to electricity. So those petrol and diesel cars are about 80% of them are converted to electric vehicles. And we've classified these three steps as general consensus because these typically are common uh, people generally agree that these are very good steps to take towards a 100% renewable energy system. That was at a time when, let's say, Germany had just decided to uh, start eliminating nuclear power from its energy production. Of course, there is now Hinkley Point in the UK, which is a turning point for nuclear, perhaps. So maybe this is not such a general consensus right now. But at the time when we developed this study, there seemed to be a general consensus that nuclear was being phased out. So that may be a bit of an assumption right now. But in any case, it still represents a scenario that we're changing. So it's the starting point is a business as usual, removing nuclear, putting in heat savings, and then converting our cars to electricity. After we've done those, let's say, general consensus steps, the next thing we do is we convert the heating sector from oil and gas boilers over to heat pumps in the countryside and district heating in the cities. In step five, we actually convert all heating to heat pumps, both cities and countryside. However, in step six, we replace the city heat pumps with district heating networks, which from our Heat Roadmap Europe work has usually come out as a much cheaper alternative. And after then we've converted the heating sector, we move on to the transport sector. We start by replacing oil in our heavy duty transport with electrofuels. So remember now our passenger vehicles have already been converted to electric cars in step four. However, in step seven, 
It's not the passenger cars we're worried about, it's the heavy duty transport, such as trucks and buses, and this is where they need some form of liquid or gas fuel. And in step seven, we produce that liquid or gas fuel via electro electrofuels, which are commonly referred to as power to liquid or power to gas fuels. And I'll explain those in a bit more detail in the next slide or two. Once we get to step seven then, we've obviously made a lot of dramatic changes. And after implementing all of these changes, we've saved a lot of coal, oil, gas, and biomass. And so what we do in step eight is something like a fuel switching. We say that because we've saved so much coal, oil, gas, and biomass, instead of using coal and oil where we need fossil fuels, let's use the clean energy formats like gas and biomass. So we simply replace the coal and oil with gas and biomass, because when we do that, the amount of gas and biomass we need is still at similar levels to what we had in the starting point. So in other words, in step eight, it's a fuel switch where we decide to prioritize using clean fossil fuels in the form of natural gas and using biomass to the level that's the same as what we start with in step one. So that means by the end of step eight, the only fossil fuel remaining is, bio, is natural gas. So in step nine, the last step we carry out is we produce more synthetic gas or electro gas via power to gas and replace this remaining natural gas. So those are the nine steps that we carried out to get to Smart Energy Europe. And the final thing I want to mention about these nine steps is an important note 10, is that in every one of these steps, we're trying to maximize the use of wind and solar power in our system. In other words, we're trying to maximize the use of intermittent renewable energy resources. And that's because, as I showed you earlier, we want to reduce the pressure on our bioenergy resource and maximize the use of wind and solar power. As I mentioned, I just elaborate a bit on what exactly are electrofuels. So electrofuels are the production of liquid or gas fuel, so high energy dense fuels for things like trucks, ships and aviation via connecting carbon and hydrogen together. So an electrofuel is produced by getting some carbon and getting some hydrogen, combining them together to produce either a liquid or gaseous fuel. This is very similar to what oil looks like today. You might often hear oil and gas being referred to as hydrocarbons. So in effect, oil and fossil fuels today are basically a combination of carbon and hydrogen done by nature. However, in an electrofuel, rather than letting nature do the hard work, we're doing the hard work. So that means we have to get some carbon and we have to get some hydrogen from somewhere to put them together to produce some liquid or gaseous fuel. In this example, I'm producing some liquid methanol or dimethyl ether. Methanol is often used to replace petrol. Dimethyl ether is often used to produce, uh, re replace diesel. So in this example, I need 250,000 tons of carbon and 1.15 terawatt hours of hydrogen to produce one terawatt hour of liquid methanol or DME. The idea is that the carbon can come from a power station or from bioenergy or from industry. For example, a cement factory could provide some carbon, while the hydrogen can come from electricity. We can use electricity in, a, in electrolysis, which would convert split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then use the hydrogen here to combine it with the carbon to produce the liquid or gas fuel. This is where the real important point comes that if the hydrogen is produced via electricity, that means we can in effect use wind and solar power to produce this liquid fuel. In other words, wind and solar power can produce the electricity. The electricity is used to create hydrogen and this hydrogen then is combined with carbon to produce liquid or gas fuel. This creates two really important synergies. Number one, it means we can use wind power in heavy duty transport. In other words, the wind power is producing electricity that eventually ends up driving a truck or a bus, which is really great because now we're getting sustainable wind energy as our energy driver for heavy duty transport. And the other really important thing is that it connects wind and solar power to very cheap fuel storage, like I pointed out earlier. Fuel storage is very cheap and it can store energy for a very long period over seasons or even years. So by using wind power to produce the hydrogen and connect this to fuel storage, now we have a really large buffer to integrate our intermittent wind and solar power. We have published a paper about how this works and a lot of details about these different pathways to produce electrofuels. So if you're interested in understanding more about that, then check out the publication in the Energy Journal. The other thing I want to mention is that all of our simulations in this project were carried out using the Energy Plan tool, which has over 3,000 users now across 100 different countries. It's freely available on our website, 
and you can learn how to use it for free using a lot of uh, friendly uh, case studies and examples and teaching material that we often teach on our courses at Albury University. So please visit the website if you'd actually like to get your hands on the model. You can also download the models we created from the Smart Energy Europe project if you'd like to play around with them and make some of your own scenarios in the tool. What I want to just highlight though is what we measured when we did these scenarios are three key parameters. We measured the amount of energy consumed in each scenario, the amount of carbon emissions to, uh, produced for each scenario, and the total cost of the system uh, for, e uh, for each scenario. And in this uh, in energy plan, the costs are annualized, so all investments, fuel costs, operation and maintenance costs, carbon costs, and so on, are all annualized into a single figure to show how much it costs on a yearly basis to keep uh, to maintain invest and operate the, the energy system in question. The reason we measure three different parameters is to create a bit of debate around which is the ideal type of energy system that we need, because naturally in some cases, even though something might reduce the costs, if it's increasing carbon emissions, we may not be happy with that. In other cases, if we're, if we're reducing the costs and increasing primary energy supply, maybe we're not happy with that either. So the three metrics enable us to have a debate around what is important to us and what, what kind of priorities do we want to have when we decide what steps to take during the transition to 100% renewable energy. So the, hopefully now you have an idea about how we carry out this transition. I can just go back a few slides to remind you that the whole thing is centered around these key steps. Going from a starting point of a business as usual scenario, implementing each of these changes until eventually by step nine we end up with a 100% renewable energy system. So we get to step part two then of this video. What will the consequences be? And this is all about trying to quantify what is the impact of implementing each of these steps. And for by quantify the impact, I am of course referring to the three things I just pointed out, primary energy, carbon emissions, and total annual energy system costs. So the first one we'll look at, energy consumption for each of the steps. So at the bottom, you can see each of the steps being listed. On the graph on the left hand side you see the total amount of energy required each year for each of these scenarios and as you can see for the first few steps all the way as far as step six we're reducing the amount of energy we need to maintain our energy system as we implement more and more renewable energy energy efficiency and better technologies in other words when we remove nuclear we put in the heat savings we convert petrol and diesel to electricity in the cars we implement heat pumps for our heating, and then we put district heating in the cities. All of these steps make our energy system much more efficient. The other thing you can see happening is that all of these steps are dramatically reducing the amount of fossil fuels that we need. We're, we're, we're having a growing trend in renewable energy, and we're having a decreasing trend in fossil fuel consumption. So overall, we're making the system more efficient, and we're increasing the use of renewable energy, all of which are leading to a lower consumption of fossil fuels. And up until step six, almost all of these technologies exist today. We can get rid of nuclear today, we can put in heat savings today, electric vehicles are right on the verge of becoming a mainstream technology as we've seen with the dramatic improvements, uh, especially thanks to Tesla in recent years. Heat pumps are a well-proven technology there's uh, almost 25% of the heat demand in Sweden is provided by heat pumps. And district heating is a very mainstream technology in many countries. For example, 60% of the heat demand in Denmark is met by district heating. So all the way as far as step six is reducing the energy demand, increasing renewables, reducing fossil fuel consumption based on existing technologies. So we can achieve all of this by just focusing on existing technologies maybe with the slight caveat that electric vehicles still need a small bit of development over the next five or ten years or so, I expect they'll become a mainstream solution. However, after step six, we start to rely on new technologies. Converting, creating electrofuels for the transport sector will require new developments, especially in electrolyzers, and they're not as efficient as mother nature. In other words, us creating uh, methanol and DME ourselves is not as efficient as mother nature creating oil for our heavy duty transport and as a result the amount of energy we need increases slightly. However, on the contrary to that, 
As I pointed out, these electrofuels connect wind and solar power to very large fuel storage, which means you can see we can integrate very large amounts of intermittent renewables by connecting wind and solar to this fuel storage. So even though we're increasing the amount of energy we need, we're also dramatically increasing the amount of renewable energy we can use. So overall, we're getting a much lower demand for fossil fuels like gas, uh, oil and coal. And it's due to this reduction in fossil fuel consumption. If you remember earlier in step eight, we decide to replace this oil and coal at the bottom with natural gas because we've saved so much since we started out in the original business as usual scenario. So you can see even after we've replaced coal and oil with gas, the amount of gas that we need is very similar to the amount we had at the beginning anyway. So by step eight, after we've done this fuel switching, we have an energy system that is almost entirely renewable energy. The only fossil fuel we have is natural gas. And we've replaced a lot of our needs with intermittent renewable energy and bioenergy. The only thing left to do then in the final step is to replace this natural gas with power to gas technology. And as you can see, because electrofuels again are not as efficient as mother nature at producing these hydrocarbons, we get an increase in the amount of energy that we need. So between step six, seven and nine, we're getting an increased demand for energy, but overall our energy consumption by, by the, in the 100% renewable energy system is still much less than what it was in the business as usual scenario. So we've had a reduction of around 10, 15% overall. So how much is this all going to cost? Well, the good news is it typically costs much less than people expect. This first bar here illustrates the cost in the business as usual scenario. And as you can see, all the way as far as step six, we end up with a, an energy system that's almost the same cost as it is today. So in other words, all of those existing technologies that I pointed out, removing nuclear, putting in the heat savings, converting to electric cars, putting in the heat pumps and combining that with district heating in the cities would leave us with an energy system that has practically the exact same energy costs as we do today. This means that we have no reason not to start implementing these changes already now. However, when we convert our transport sector from oil over to these electrofuels, there is a slight increase in our energy system costs of around maybe a few percent. And in the final step, when we get rid of the natural gas, that's when we have a really big jump in our energy system costs. In other words, to go from step eight, where we just have natural gas remaining, over to step nine, where we have 100% a renewable energy system results in an increase of around 10 or 15 percent in our energy systems costs. So there is quite a big jump at the end. However, overall, the 100 percent renewable energy scenario is not a magnitude of difference more than what we started out with in the business as usual scenario. Another really uh, two further really important points about all of this. Point one is that out of all of these costs, the bottom two colors represent vehicles. So the green is trucks and buses and the, 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 the dark pink is cars. And the reason I've included vehicle costs is when we do things like change from petrol and diesel to electric cars and when we change from uh, diesel and petrol over to electrofuels, we need to include the price of our vehicles because a lot of the costs are buried in the vehicles during those changes. However, as you can see, vehicles account for a very large proportion of our energy systems costs, making up almost half if we include them in the analysis. So that's one really important point. The second very important point I want to make after I've removed the vehicle costs, I want to just remove the vehicle costs to give you a more um, detailed picture of what's happening in the energy system. And as you can see in the business as usual scenario, our costs are very much linked to fuel fuels because we need to buy a lot of oil, gas and coal every year to maintain our energy needs. However, in the future, if we convert to renewable energy, we're going to change from a fuel based system to an investment based system. And that's represented here by the green uh, color. And why the reason that happens is because when we build a wind turbine or a solar plant, there's no fuel required to power those once they're built. We need to pay for the infrastructure on day one, but we don't need to pay for anything else after that. And that means we don't need a lot of fuel anymore. Instead, we need a lot of investments. So in, our, in today's energy system, we spend a lot of money on fuel, but in a renewable energy system, we need to spend a lot of money on infrastructure. We need a lot of investments. And the reason that this is so important is due to risk.
if you're going to spend all of your money on investments on day one, you're of course probably going to have to finance those investments using some loans or so on. And the risk associated with those investments will have a major impact on the price of your overall energy system. Because if we can develop policies that are very risk adverse or, or low risk, that means the amount of interest that will be charged on the on the loans we take out to build this infrastructure will be very low, which means the cost of our energy system will be very low. However, if we can't put stable and secure policies in place, then the risk associated with buying a wind farm on day one and assuming that it will be paid back over its lifetime will become much higher, which means that the amount of interest you'll be charged on the loan to build your wind farm on day one will be much higher which means the costs of our energy system will be much higher. In other words, if we have a high risk scenario, we'll need to charge much more interest on the loans we give out to build this infrastructure, which will create much higher costs for our energy system. This is why secure, low risk, long term policies are so important to keep the cost of a renewable energy system down. If we have low risk, stable policies long into the future, this will reduce the cost of these investments and keep it at a comparable level to our business as usual scenario. However, if there's a lot of risk with these investments, it'll dramatically increase the price of our energy system. So that just shows you how we're not just moving, we're moving from a fuel based system to an investment based system as we increase our renewable energy production. The final thing then, the carbon emissions, the green chart here demonstrates the amount of carbon emissions. As you can see, when we remove nuclear power, there is a jump in carbon emissions. However, as we implement all the other steps, these all dramatically reduce that until we reach, let's say, the end of step six, where we have uh, maybe over a third of our CO2 emissions are saved. And remember, this was mostly based on existing technologies at a relatively similar level of cost to what we have today. After step six, then we get another major drop in carbon emissions as we introduce electrofuels until we eventually reach step nine, where we have a 100% renewable energy system. And there's only a very small amount of carbon emissions from the likes of waste incineration and byproducts of that type. Um, there is, of course, some carbon emissions still associated with bioenergy here. But in this study, we've assumed that bioenergy is carbon neutral. But for those of you who believe that bioenergy is not carbon neutral, then there would, of course, be some extra bio, uh, CO2 emissions associated with the bioenergy. But overall, much, much less than what we have in today's energy system. These white diamonds also illustrate the amount of renewable energy we're getting in each scenario. So if we look at step six, for example, by the end of that step, we have around over 40% of our uh, energy is provided by renewable energy, and it's at relatively similar costs than it is today. So that's almost double what we have today. By going to step seven, we reach around 70%, almost 70% renewable energy between step seven and step eight, um, if we go that far. And then to get from the final 70% to 100%, of course, requires that jump in costs of about 10 to 15% as I outlined earlier. So we can get to around 70% with very little difference in the amount of money that we pay for our energy each year. But to get to that final jump will require quite a significant, it will require some increase in our energy costs. And that kind of sums up the Smart Energy or a project in a, in a very brief way. You can go, as I said, to the smartenergysystem.eu website, read a lot more about the Smart Energy System concept uh, through some books and journal papers we've published. You can also look at other case studies such as Denmark and Ireland, as well as Europe, which I've showed you today. You can subscribe to our YouTube channels um, and uh, follow some of the videos we've made about the Smart Energy System, Smart Heating Europe which is from the Heat Roadmap Europe study, and a lot of tutorials we show about how we do our analysis. And then I'll just wrap up by saying the key conclusions are that based on our analysis, around 50% renewable energy is technically possible based on existing technologies with very little increase uh, or almost no increase in the cost of our energy system. 100% renewable energy is technically viable, although we do need some developments in electrofuels or indeed another concept I'm working on right now, which is called electric roads. So getting the 100% of the way is still not fully bulletproof. We need some new developments in new technologies. However, based on current projections, getting to 70% renewable energy is around the same cost as a fossil fuel scenario, while getting to 100% renewable energy will require an increase of around 10 to 15% in our energy costs. 
Finally, I just want to end this with just a brief note that, of course, all of these analyses are just drafts, are kind of based on our current knowledge. We're improving them all the time. We're always building upon them. Right now, I'm trying to include a new technology called Electric Roads, which you can read more about on my website. Uh, to see if that's a good addition to the smart energy system concept. So this is, let's say, this is what we know already today. And what we know today is that we can go a long way based on existing technologies. But once we get to around 40 or 50 percent renewable energy, we do need some breakthroughs such as electrofuels, power to gas, power to fuel, or electric roads. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the video and keep tuned for some videos in the future.